If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 5 as we continue this journey through the Psalms uh, to move from here to hope. While you're turning there, we want to remind you that, uh, that we depend upon your tithes and offerings uh, today in the pandemic, just as we do every week. Uh, and you have been so faithful to be generous in your giving. And I'm thankful for you, church family. You have been spectacular in taking the opportunities to give tithes and offerings as an act of worship and faithfulness to God. And uh, just remind you that you can give online. Uh, You can give using a mobile app. Uh, or you can mail in your tithes and offerings, encourage you to do that very thing uh, and continue, and let's continue to be faithful in our stewardship. In Psalm chapter 5, we're looking at uh, what some have called a morning psalm, and I I like that. Uh, If you remember, Psalm chapter 4 was an evening psalm because the psalmist talked about uh, coming to the Lord in prayer during the evening time. Psalm chapter 5, verse 3 says, early in the morning, I'm going to come to you, O Lord. And I think that is uh, so powerful as we consider what it is that God is teaching us in Psalm 5. I don't know about you, but uh, when I get in my car in the morning, every morning I get in my car, I turn on the ignition, uh, I back out of my driveway, and I point my car in the direction where I need to end up. And I make lefts and right turns. I, I, uh, I get on a highway, and I get off the highway, and I make some more turns, and the destination Uh, that I end up at is 312 Kempsville Road here uh, at our church building. And every day I drive my car from my house to the church. When I finish work uh, in the evening time, I get back in my car, I turn on the ignition, and I begin to drive with the destination in mind. And I decide to turn left or right, get on the highway, get off the highway, uh, and drive into Uh, my driveway at my house. That was my destination. Uh, Cars don't drive themselves, at least not yet. Cars don't drive themselves. Uh, Cars go where you and I drive them. Uh, In the same way, uh, if we want to get to a particular destination, it's because we're driving ourselves to that destination. Uh, Certainly, as we consider our life every day, uh, we want to end up at the end of the day uh, at a good destination. We want our life to be marked by something that is positive and encouraging, uh, strengthening and courageous. We want our destination uh, to be uh, a joyful destination. We want our destination at the end of each day to be filled with the blessings that we so desperately desire. We want the end of our day to be marked by security. That's the kind of life we want to have each day, a life of joy, a life of blessing, and a life of security. Psalm 5 talks to us about having that kind of destination each day. Uh, If you look at Psalm chapter 5, if you look at verse 11 and 12, we see the destination uh, for the psalmist and the destination that God promises us uh, through this passage. Verse 11 and 12, "Let uh, let all those rejoice who put their trust in you, O Lord. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround him as with a shield. The psalmist declared the destination that he longed to have in verses 11 and 12, and it's a destination that you and I can get on board with. It's a destination that I think every human heart desires. We want to have our days marked by joy, not just any kind of joy, but the happy dance of life. We want every day to be marked by joy, joyful celebration, overflowing joy. We want our life every day to be marked by blessing, abundant blessing, And we want our life each day to be marked by safety and security. 
But in order to get to that destination, it requires decisions on our part. You see, our decisions lead us to the destination that is promised in this passage. The decisions we make lead us to a destination. But the psalmist also teaches us that our beliefs drive our decision. So in this psalm, what we see is uh, beliefs that the psalmist has driving decisions that the psalmist makes that leads to the destination that we all want to experience. In the same way, I want us to consider the beliefs that lead to the decisions that lead to the destination of joy, blessing, and security every single day. In fact, if I were to sum up this psalm in, in, a, in a sentence, it would be that we believe that God, in his great love, makes a way for us to live joyfully blessed in the security of his grace through Jesus. Let me say that again. We believe that God, in his great love, makes a way for us to live joyfully blessed in the security of his grace through Jesus. Our belief leads to decisions that give us a destination. Do you want to have a life that's marked by joy? A life that's joyfully blessed in security? Then we need to have a belief that leads us to that destination. The psalmist marks out these beliefs uh, as he describes his prayer to the Lord and as he describes the love of God. He marks out for us the belief that we must have that will drive decisions that we must make in order to get to the destination that we desire. And these beliefs drive the car of our life every single day. So as we look at this passage, what are these beliefs that we must have? Well, as we look at Psalm chapter 5, look in verses uh, 1 and 2. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Give heed to, my vo to the voice of my cry, and the, here's the phrase, my King and my God. As we begin uh, looking at the beliefs that lead to the destination that we desire, uh, that belief begins with God and who he is. The psalmist began his journey of prayer and petition and his journey in life every morning. He begins with this declaration, my king and my God. Uh, friends, that's not just a confession of religious devotion. That is truly uh, a, a belief, a, a, a system of belief that we must have. In order to make decisions that lead to a destination that we desire, we need to begin with the belief that God is my king and my God. And what does that mean? It means that we believe that God, the God of Scripture, the God of the Bible, the God who sent Jesus for our rescue, the God of creation, the God of the cosmos, is the king of our lives. Not just our lives, but every life. That God, here it is, we believe that God has authority, ultimate authority over our lives. If we're going to get to a destination that is joyfully blessed in security by God's grace through Jesus, we must begin with the belief that God has ultimate authority over our lives. That's what it means when the psalmist says, he's my king and my God. It means that he has authority. He has the right to lay claim to our lives and every detail of our lives. That he has the right and the power to help us, uh, to bless us, to secure us in his great grace. 
that he has the right to demand from us a certain lifestyle because he is God, because he is our king, he is our sovereign. We answer to him. He doesn't answer to us. We have this core fundamental belief that God has ultimate authority over our lives. That belief leads to decisions that lead to a destination marked by joyful blessing in the security of God's grace. We believe that God has ultimate authority over our lives. Uh, Secondly, we believe that sin carries with it consequences. Sin carries with it consequences. We see this pronounced fearfully in strong language in verses 4 through 6 and verses 9 and 10. Verse 4, uh, the psalmist declares, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You despise all workers of iniquity. You de- devastate those who speak falsehood. The Lord despises the bloodthirsty and the deceitful person. Verses 9 and 10, there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is devastation. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter or deceive or slander with their own tongue. They pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. So we believe that God has ultimate authority over our lives. We also believe that sin carries with it consequences, and those consequences are devastating. We believe that rebellion against God carries with it separation and isolation from God. God does not dwell with sin. And if you and I have sinned, God does not hang out with us. Oh, what a devastating life it is without God's presence. Ephesians chapter 2 says that uh, apart from God, we live without hope. It says that, that apart from God, we live dead in our sin and our trespass. Yeah, sin carries with it consequence. And if we're going to get to the destination that is marked by joyful blessing in the security of God's grace, we need to understand that God has ultimate authority. He is my God and my King. And God uh, declares that sin has consequences. Anytime we rebel against God, uh, there are consequences for that rebellion. Ultimately, the, re- the, the consequence for sin is separation from God. Uh, we are not part of his family. Now, this is the terrible news that began in Genesis chapter 3, that because sin entered the scene of human history, all of us have uh, uh, spiraled down that uh, vortex of, of misery and pain toward devastation, toward death, because of our sin. Your sin separates you from God. My sin separates me from God. Sin has its consequences. We believe, and these beliefs drive our decisions, but we believe that God has ultimate authority over our lives. We believe that sin has consequences, but then good news enters the picture. We believe that God's love makes a way for our sin to be forgiven so that we can enter into his family. Go down to verse 7. Verse 7, But uh, as for me, the psalmist declares, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. As for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. That phrase, multitude of your mercy, is a picture of God's rescuing love, of his faithful love, of his steadfast love. This is a picture of the love of God that brings us into his family. Here is God's love that gives us hope. It is found in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, we know that God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were sinners, Christ died on a cross for us. And this is love. 
uh, uh, 1 John says, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and he gave himself, as, and he sent his son as the payment price for our sin. We can know the love of God that makes us fit for God's family, and the way we take hold of that love displayed to us is by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus came to build a bridge between sinners like you and me and a holy God. Jesus came because God loves you, and he came to rescue us. You know, you see, we believe that God is the ultimate authority over our life, and we believe when we rebel against God, there are consequences. But we also believe that God's great love gives us hope and shapes our heart for hope. For with God, there is forgiveness through Christ. We believe that Jesus is our only hope in this life and for each day because Jesus gives us a bridge into God's family through his death and resurrection. Through faith in Jesus Christ, our hearts find a home in the family of God. That is what we believe. We believe that God is the ultimate authority over life. We believe that sin carries consequences. And we believe that God's love has made a way for us to be part of his family through the forgiving forgiveness that Jesus has purchased for us in his death on the cross. Well, when those beliefs drive our decisions, then we will end up in a glorious destination. When those beliefs, when we do believe that God is the ultimate authority of our life, and we do believe that sin or disobedience to God brings about consequences, and we do believe that God's love makes a way for us to live fully human lives, to experience the true self that we really are through the forgiveness that he offers us in the person of Jesus, then we can begin to make decisions that will drive the car of our life each day toward that destination that we desperately desire. Now, that, th those decisions that the psalmist makes... Uh, begin uh, at the beginning of the psalm. As, as we look at this psalm, we hear the psalmist, based upon his belief that, uh, that he's uh, uh, in relationship with God, this my God, my king, the psalmist knew that he was part of God's family, therefore uh, he had been forgiven his sin, he had been brought into the family of God, and now he makes decisions based upon that relationship with God. So today, as you are driving the car of your life, if you believe that God has the ultimate authority over everything about you, if you believe that sin has its consequence, if you believe that God has made a way through Jesus for us to be part of his family because of Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, then you begin to make decisions about your every day based upon those beliefs. Beliefs drive our decisions. Now, what are these decisions that the psalmist makes? Well, the first decision that we can make each day that will end up uh, in a destination where we are joyfully blessed in the security of God's grace through Jesus, the first decision that we make as we drive the car is to, cry, uh, to confidently cry out to God for help. We can confidently cry out to God for help. Look at verses 1 through 3. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you. I will look up. As we I hear David crying out to the Lord. He's crying out because he knows that he belongs to God. And if we belong to God, then we can cry confident to, confidently to the Lord and find help. Uh, look, if, if you want to end up in that destination of joyfully blessed in the security of God's presence by his grace, then cry out to the Lord today. 
cry out to him. We believe that we belong to God, that we are part of his family. So just as a son or a daughter cries out to his mother or father for help when he's hurting or in need, and that mother or father responds to his child with a tenderness and a compassion, with truth and with grace to help in their time of need. In the same way, and yet even more perfectly, God, our loving Father, hears the cry of his children, and he moves to help. When you wake up in the morning, I know the temptation is to look inside or to look around, but friends, when you wake up in the morning, look up to God. Cry out to him. Unburden your heart before him. And with confidence that God is a loving father who cares for his children, God will hear our cry. He will respond to our cry, and he will resolve our cry. When we trust the one who loves us most, we have hope. So confidently cry out to God for the help that you desperately need every single day. Begin the day early and often crying out to God for help. When we believe that God is the ultimate authority over our life and that sin has its consequence and that God in his love has brought us into his family through faith in Jesus Christ, then we can have confidence to decide, right now I'm crying out to God. Oh, God, the anxious places of my life, the troubled spots of my soul. Oh, God, the circumstances that I cannot manage and the situations that I cannot control, I unburden them and I lay them before you, my loving Father. Jesus said, hey, listen, if your son or daughter asks you, an earthly father, for food or bread, you're going to respond by giving them food or bread. How much, Jesus said, how much more will your loving Father who is in heaven, God himself, take care of those who belong to him? God loves you most. Trust him first and foremost for the help that you need. He is the authority over your life, but he's also the personal God who longs to help you. Cry out to God for help. Cry out confidently to God for help. The second decision that we make based upon our belief is that we must enter God's presence because of his love. And look down in verse 7 again. Verse 7, the psalmist says, but as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. The steadfast love of God given to us through the person of Jesus Christ forgives our sin and makes us fit for God's family. And it's that self-same love that invites us into God's presence each day. Oh, friends, listen, if we're going to drive to the place of being joyfully blessed in the security of God's grace each day, it's because we have entered God's presence in worship, where we adore him as our God and as our king, where we come into his presence and we confess that he has ultimate authority over our life and that we live to serve him and to honor him. We enter his presence because we're part of his family. You want to experience joy today? There is no greater place to find joy than living in the presence of God throughout the day. Today, the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, lead me, O God, in the paths of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You want to have joy then it comes as you dwell in the presence of God. We confidently cry out to God for help because we believe that he is our God and our king and that he has brought us into his family through faith in Jesus Christ. Now we enter God's presence because Jesus and the expression of God's magnificent love has made us fit for God's family, and we find joy in his presence as we adore him and submit to him and humble ourselves before him. 
the decisions we make that will drive us to the destination of being joyfully blessed in the security of God's grace is to confidently cry out to God for help early and often, to enter into his presence because of his great love. And finally, the decision we make is that we will follow the path that God maps for us. I want you to look at the second part of verse 7 and then verse 8. It says, in fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my eyes. Now, what's he talking about there? Well, the second part of verse 7 talks about living in the fear of the Lord. Living in the fear of the Lord is living by the belief that God has ultimate authority over our lives, that sin has its consequence, but God in his love has made a way for us to be part of his family. And because of that belief, we're going to adjust our life to fit God's will. There's no other place to find peace, joy, happiness, hope than centered in the will of God. If we're going to experience the fullness of joy today and every day, it's because we live by the fear of the Lord. We live adjusting our decisions based upon God's authority, adjusting our decisions based upon God's righteousness and holiness, adjusting our decisions based upon God's great love. To live by the fear of the Lord means that we will follow the path that God maps out. That path of verse 8 is a picture of God being the shepherd who leads us along safe and secure paths to a destination that delights our soul. It's the picture of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Oh, yes, today, trust the Lord God who desires to make straight paths for you to live secure in the center of his will. See, we do believe that God desires the very best for those who belong to him. And the map that he is making for your life today, the path that he is calling you to follow today is not for your harm, but it is for your good. It is to take you to the destination that you desperately desire, the destination where you are joyfully blessed in the security of God's grace. When we believe that God is the ultimate authority and that sin has its consequence and God's love has made a way to, for us to be part of his family, it leads to the decisions of crying confidently to the Lord for help, of entering into his presence because of his love, and uh, by following the path that God maps for us. When we do that each day, our beliefs drive our decisions, and they take us to the destination of verses 11 and 12. Again, verse 11 and 12, let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround him as a shield. Verse 11, joy and rejoicing belongs to those whose belief in God drives the decisions that they make each day. Verse 12 tells us that when we walk the path that God has mapped for us, he will bless us. And he will surround us with the security of his favor. I, I desperately want you to find that kind of joy. I want to I find that joy every day where I'm living in the blessing of God 
because I'm walking hand in hand with him. But also remember that sin has its consequence. And the only remedy for sin is what Jesus has done for us on the cross. You see, when our belief does not include God, when we don't believe that sin carries any consequence and we can live any way we want, it'll lead to decisions where God is not part of the equation and this psalm tells us that the destination that we will face is misery and isolation and devastation. But it doesn't have to be that way for any of us today. There is forgiveness with God for you. If you are here today and you have yet to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior, I invite you today to come to Christ by faith. The Bible says that Jesus died in your place for your sin, that through uh, his death, he provides forgiveness for you, a forgiveness that makes you fit for God's family. But you and I, we must humble our hearts before him. And we must come to him not as one who has all the answers, but as one who is bending before him in need of his forgiveness. Yes, with God's love, we have hope. And God's love is offered to sinners like you and me to rescue us from the sin and the cell of our shame and to provide a bridge through the death and resurrection of Jesus into his family so that we might live each day joyfully blessed in the security that his grace provides through faith in Jesus Christ. I invite everyone, wherever you are, to bow your heads right now in prayer. And perhaps today you are that one somebody uh, who has yet to embrace Jesus as Savior and King. You are living isolated from him because of your sin. You're living in misery because God is not... Uh, part of your belief system, and he's not in the equations of your everyday life. And you're living uh, with devastation in your soul. I invite you to come to Christ today. I invite you to cry out to Jesus, believing that God is the ultimate authority over your life and that your sin carries the consequence of misery, isolation, and judgment. Now come to Jesus, the expression of God's love, that offers forgiveness through his death on the cross and new life through his resurrection from the dead. If that is the desire of your heart, if you long to get off the merry-go-round of misery upon which you have been traveling, if you're ready to let your belief in God's authority, sin's consequence, and God's love to drive your decisions each day, then here's where it begins. Will you come to Christ, repenting your sin and trusting in him, as your only hope. The Bible says that if we confess that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we can be saved. Will you believe that Jesus is your Lord? Will you confess that he is your king? And will you repent your sin, turn from your sin today and, and abandon it and embrace the forgiving love that God offers Will you take hold the new life that he provides? If that's the desire of your heart, and I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I acknowledge that I have sinned against you, and my sin carries the consequence of separation and isolation from you. I believe that you, in your love, sent Jesus to rescue me. Through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, you've provided forgiveness for a sinner like me. And so today I pray and I ask that you would apply what Jesus has done to my account. God, I'm desperate and I need you in my life. I long to experience a life that is joyfully blessed in security through your grace. And so today I ask you to forgive my sin. I ask Jesus to be the supreme king of my life 
and I commit to follow him every day that I live. Thank you, O oh God, for forgiving me of my sin and giving me a new life today. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I invite you to uh, text Jesus to the number on the screen, or you can email me at pastor at firstnorfolk.org. Today is the first day of a joyful life for all who come to faith in Jesus Christ.